A really big, um, yeah, welcome to everyone who's joined this evening. Uh, my name's Wiz, I'm a campaigner at Debt Justice, and I'm going to be your host tonight for, for this joint event with CAFOD on debt, colonialism and power. So with the general election literally just having been announced, it feels like the timing really couldn't be better to be having this call. So this evening, we're going to be hearing from two brilliant speakers who are going to take us through some of the history of the debt crisis and how debt is impacting countries around the world today. They're going to explain the colonial origins of debt, how in today's economy debt is used as a form of power and talk about what we can do together to get debt cancelled in this critical election period. After the speakers, there's going to be time for questions, um, at which point we'll ask you to put any questions you've got for our speakers into the chat box. So we should have about 10 to 15 minutes for this, and we're going to finish at eight o'clock. Um, before I introduce um, our speakers to you, I'm just going to run through a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, we're going to be keeping everyone muted during this webinar, just to make sure that we can hear from all the speakers from both of our speakers without any interruptions. Um, if you have got questions at any point during the call, please post these in the chat box. And what we're planning to do is to, to collate these questions for our speakers throughout the event. And we'll put these questions to our speakers during the Q&A at the end. Um, at a few points during the call, we'll share links to our online actions in the chat box. Um, and lastly, we're going to be recording this event so that we can share it afterwards. We'll email it to all, to everyone who booked a, who's booked a place, um, and you'll be able to find it on our YouTube channel too. So we're really thrilled tonight to be joined by two brilliant speakers. Um, so first, we're going to be hearing from uh, Maria Finity from CAFOD, um, who's the Economic Justice and Policy Lead. And Maria is going to take us through some of the background to the current global debt crisis, uh, how we've ended up in this situation, the impact it's having on lower income countries around the world and what we can do about it. Then we'll be hearing from Bernard Anaba, who's a debt campaigner from the Integrated Social Development Centre in Ghana. He'll be telling us firsthand about how the, the debt crisis is impacting people in Ghana explaining the colonial roots of the crisis and how people are resisting. So without further ado, I will hand over to Maria. Thank you so much, Wiz. And hi, everyone. Um, as Wiz has said, uh, my name's Maria. I'm a development economist um, and I lead on economic policy at CAFOD. Um, it's Great to see so many of you here today to discuss the new global debt crisis. Some of you may remember the historic Jubilee debt campaign in the late 90s and early 2000s and how tens of thousands of people from all around the world came together to demand debt relief for the world's poorest countries. The situation today is just as critical as it was in 2000. So it's great to see so many of you here this evening to kind of reflect the severity of the situation. So I want to start with a number and that number is 18. This year in 2024, Ghana and Sri Lanka have accepted their 18th debt bailout packages since they won independence in the mid 20th century. And they're not alone. Dozens of other countries are trapped in similar cycles of debt and bailout and crisis. And, you know, they say the definition of madness is repeating the same thing over, over and over again and expecting a different result. And I can't help but feel that that's exactly what the world is doing when it comes to debt. Um, so I'm going to try to explain a bit about why the current system isn't working and what we can do about it. I'll start by briefly exploring how today's global debt landscape is a direct legacy of colonialism. Um, I'll give you a very brief history of the role that international debt played throughout the 20th century. And then we'll take a look at the current global debt crisis and why a debt justice law in the UK is so essential. So today's global South debt is a very clear legacy of colonialism. 
Following hundreds of years of colonization and wealth and resource extraction, former colonial states had no, um, formerly colonized states had no option but to borrow from their former col colonizers who were now in possession of the majority of the world's wealth um, in order to have finances with which to build their new independent states. And not only had these newly independent states been stripped of their resources and wealth, but when they did finally gain independence, they were also burdened with massive debts that had been accumulated previously by their colonial rulers in many cases. So many countries like Ghana were born with debt and um, forced to borrow from their, from their formal, former colonizers right from the offset. And this was obviously a huge financial burden for these um, newly independent states, but it wasn't just a financial burden. It was also a tool to keep these nations economically dependent on wealthier countries and um, under control. And there were all sorts of benefits to this for wealthier countries from opening up new markets for them to export to, to um, having access to cheap raw materials from their former colonies. Um, so this debt formed an essential kind of component of the neoliberal global economic structures that were starting to take shape. Um, and often the money that low income countries were borrowing came with harsh conditions, which stifled their development um, and enabled wealthier countries to effectively dictate their economic policies, um, thus also undermining their political development as you know, um, nascent democracies. And the structural adjustment programs, which were imposed by the International Monetary Fund, the IMF and the World Bank, are probably the most famous and obvious example of damaging conditions um, on loans with the IMF IMF itself having admitted in several publications at this point that the economic policies attached to their loans under the structural adjustment programs in the late uh, 20th century had failed to produce development and plunged millions into even more extreme poverty. In exchange for the loans, um, they were requiring countries to slash public spending and open their markets to foreign investment and competition. And Anyone who studied economic history, like I have, knows that without investing in health, education, research and development, basic infrastructure, and without nurturing and protecting key domestic industries, economic development is nearly impossible. Um, you know, looking back through history, no country that is wealthy today um, achieved development without these kinds of investments and protections. And yet debt, was used and is still being used, unfortunately, as a tool to prevent other countries from, from implementing these same policies that have led to development for today's wealthy countries. So in other words, wealthy countries have kind of pulled up the ladder behind themselves um, and are using debt as a tool um, to effectively keep a lot of low income countries uh, trapped in a, in a state of low development, low economic development. So unable to produce resources for themselves, uh, low income countries around the world remain reliant on the wealthy world for financing and remain subject to punitive conditions that make it extremely difficult for them to develop themselves and break out of the debt cycle. So that brings us to the present. So where are we at today? The historic Jubilee 2000 campaign succeeded as as some of you will remember, in cancelling $130 billion worth of debt for 36 countries. It was really a monumental success. And yet, here we are again, facing a new global debt crisis because countries remain trapped in this cycle of debt and default that makes long-term sustainable development so difficult. And until we change the legislative and economic structures that trap countries in poverty, uh, leaving them reliant on foreign debt, we will continue to find ourselves in these cycles of, of default and crisis. So today, the number of countries in or approaching debt crisis uh, has more than doubled over the past decade, 
And according to the UN, global public debt has increased fourfold since the millennium. The situation is now so severe that most global leaders agree that we need to find an urgent solution to this crisis. So attempts have been made to, to try to address this crisis. During the COVID-19 pandemic, which worsened the uh, you know already um, building debt, debt crisis globally, the G20 countries created a common framework for debt relief and restructuring, but it hasn't worked. And this is partially because the global debt landscape today is more complicated even than it was in 2000. In 2000, most debt was owed either to financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank, or to wealthy countries like the UK and the US, who could then bilaterally agree to cancel debts. But today, almost half of global sovereign debts, sovereign debt being debt that's owed by a sovereign country, is owed to private creditors. So we're talking about global private creditors like asset managers and hedge funds, organizations like BlackRock and HSBC. And so the G20 Common Framework is deadlocked because while countries like the UK, the US and China are agreeing to debt relief, you know, coming to historic agreements between China and uh, G20, uh, G7 countries, um, private creditors like BlackRock and HSBC are refusing to cooperate, and this is deadlocking the process. Instead, these private creditors are demanding full repayment with high interest, often extortionate levels of interest, um, and even in some cases threatening to sue countries that are facing severe crises. So this has led to a deadlock. We've seen countries in the last few years like Zambia unable to move forward with debt restructuring and relief because huge global asset managers refuse to negotiate, even when all other creditors, um, all other lenders are coming to the table and negotiating and trying to take part constructively in these negotiations. So this is where we come in. Um, the UK, has a unique opportunity to lead the way with a debt justice law that compels private creditors to engage in debt relief processes. So the law would effectively prevent creditors from suing debtor country governments for more than they would receive if they were to cooperate and take part in debt restructuring processes on the same terms as other lenders. And the reason why the UK is so uniquely placed to act on this is because 90% of debt held by the world's poorest countries is governed by English law. 90%. That is enormous. Um, much of the rest of it, it is governed under New York law. And um, a kind of parallel and complementary piece of legislation is currently being debated in the New York Senate. Um, but the UK really has a tremendous responsibility and opportunity to make a significant impact in this area, more so than, than any other country. Um, and, you know, this legislation would be um, transformative. It's essential that it happens, but it's not radical. There's a precedent for this. It's happened before. The last Labour government passed a similar law in 2010, the Debt Relief Developing Countries Act. And this act prevented private creditors from suing for more than they would have received if they'd participated in a previous debt restructuring process. Um, and it passed, it was successful. Um, a review of the law that was held by the Conservative and Lib Dem coalition governments that succeeded the last Labour government found that it had had no adverse consequences and that it had not reduced the amount of financing available to developing countries, which is one of the things that um, that the City of London were kind of scaremongering around before the law was brought in. But that, but that didn't happen. Um, but that law is now out of date. It no longer applies to the current G20 common framework. And so we need a new updated version of this law to, to break the deadlock within the current framework. So this debt justice law would do a couple of things. It would ease the debt restructuring processes for countries in, in distress. It would protect debtor countries from predatory banks and hedge funds. And it would help to prevent debt crises from reoccurring by reducing the incentive for risky and predatory lending by the private sector 
from taking place in the first place. So to conclude, to, kind of, to sum up, um, this legislation is essential. Alone, it won't be enough. We need, in the longer term, a permanent, transparent and representative debt relief mechanism within the UN system to improve the stability of the global economy and ensure that debtor countries are heard and represented. But this is an essential first step. And uh, as was mentioned, with a change of government set to happen sooner, than, even sooner than expected in the UK, now is an absolutely pivotal moment for us to act on this. Um, so thank you so much for listening and I really look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Maria. That was a, such a comprehensive overview of the debt crisis. Um, and yeah, like like you were saying, you know, the uh, with a general election just having been called, this is we've got oh, such a big opportunity now over the over the coming weeks and beyond to get debt cancellation onto the political agenda. Um, I mean, this now is a really big chance for us to show party leaders that the debt crisis really is an issue that matters to us as voters. So that's why we've been building a big petition that's targeting all party leaders which we will be handing in ahead of the election. Um, if you haven't already signed that petition, you can do so now by clicking on the, the links that Helen's gonna be sharing shortly in the chat box. Um, also for, just to say that for, for those of you or for anyone who's who lives or is based in and around the Southeast, on Tuesday the 4th of June, we're planning a um, a stunt outside the offices of BlackRock, which Maria mentioned, which is um, Ghana's biggest private lender. So if you're if you're based in and around London and you're free to join us on that day, um, we'll be sharing we're just sharing the link to the registration page, and we'll be um, emailing that to everybody after the webinar as well. Um, so anyway. Uh, to tell us more about the debt crisis now and how we got here, I'm really pleased to be able to pass over to Bernard Anaba, um, who's joining us from ISADEC in Ghana. Welcome, Bernard. Thank you, Louise, and uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, so thank you, Maria, for giving us that uh, splendid overview uh, about the debt crisis and the fact that it is a scheme or a ploy that keeps developing countries like Ghana uh, hooked on debt and continuously being able to supply raw material to rich countries and also to prop up the profits of the big banks and financial institutions such as the hedge funds. So basically, I will look at um, the situation uh, right from the uh, time Ghana gained independence and what has happened up to now. The evidence showed that uh, it's a ploy or a scheme to keep some countries developing and being uh, the suppliers of raw material uh, to rich countries and to rich businesses. Now, when Ghana gained independence uh, in 1957 from uh, Great Britain, uh, the country was uh, saddled with debt and an economy that was structured in a way to produce raw materials and export mm -hmm. raw materials. Ghana had a narrow base of raw material on which to rely for economic development. And that is uh, gold and uh, cocoa. So Ghana produced gold and cocoa in enormous quantity to help in the national development. Uh, if you look at the infrastructure that the British and other uh, colonial government who have been in Ghana had left behind was actually in a way to uh, supply or enable the production of these resources, particularly gold and uh, uh, cocoa, which is often uh, exported uh, outside the country for foreign exchange for development. But this resource is also very much uh, uh, open to fluctuations in the world market and also uh, economic shops around the world, which uh, keeps that particular, uh, the gold and the cocoa market not reliable for as a resource base for development. So you realize that uh, at independent Ghana did not have much done to rely on cocoa and gold. 
but uh, in terms of the local economy, there wasn't that much. In terms of tax and other uh, local economic development was very low. And when the first president of Ghana, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, tried to bring about import substitution, local industry, to kind of uh, alter the economy, diversify the economy into an economy that doesn't rely on the narrow base of uh, gold and cocoa, uh, he got into trouble because he was seen as being more of a socialist. He was expanding too much of the government and looking more towards the East. So his government had a problem. He was overthrown in a coup d'etat in 1966. Uh, subsequently, between the 1960 to 1980s, Ghana had about eight different governments. So the country was never stable right after independence and was never able to start development uh, at a level that will support uh, human development as well. So at that point, by 1980, 1983, Ghana's debt was so high and in terms of hardship, poverty was almost 50%. About half of the population was uh, living under $1 a day, which is the uh, uh, benchmark for poverty around the world. Uh, so the World Bank and the IMF came in with the idea that it will help Ghana to restructure its economy and return the economy into a productive economy that will serve the interests of the people. But it turned out that uh, that ploy wasn't actually in the benefit of Ghanaians. The World Bank loan at in the 1980s uh, to, like Maria said earlier on, to help in structural adjustment, uh, basically forced Ghana to liberalize its economy uh, to be able to uh, improve on its macro uh, economic situation, which means that uh, foreign actors are able to play and able to uh, export uh, and also bring in their dollars of foreign currency without much of lo a loss because the economy would have been in sync with the global economy in terms of the macro indicators. So um, that uh, led to many layoffs in terms of Ghanaian workers, up to about 30,000 people were laid off. Uh, at a point in time, uh, most of the uh, nascent uh, young uh, local industries that the first president tried to put in place in the productive sector were all di uh, divested for the private sector, basically corrupt local officials who, with their foreign backers, bought into a lot of these uh, nascent industries, which I often said as not uh, being efficient, uh, state-run. Uh, there were also cuts in welfare, social services, and liberalization of the exchange rate in the banking sector to uh, be able to allow foreign uh, businesses to invest into Ghana without much risk. But at the end of the day, there was a cost to be shared, but uh, if you look at it, the poor and the working class actually suffered most with this cost in terms of the layoffs that was uh, you know, visited on them directly, in terms of the diversification or diversification from the uh, local industries where most of these uh, nascent industries were sold out to other foreigners or corrupt local officials who had uh, their way around to be able to buy this. So Ghana never got, was never able to build a sustainable local industry to improve an, its economy. So it meant that in terms of productivity, uh, the government was not able to raise enough taxes. And over time, what it meant is that there was a, a economic decline in terms of productivity. There was no development uh, or, uh, or investment in the development of the human capital, in terms of education, health, all those sectors went down because of the liberalized, uh, 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 the, the liberalization, uh, 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 policies that the IMF and the World Bank visited on Ghana. So by the 2000s, Ghana was heavily indebted. Uh, more than uh, about uh, more than 100 percent of GDP in terms of debt to GB GDP, which means that all the productivity of Ghana was not enough to pay for its debt. So the IMF uh, and the World Bank again came in, but this time there was a the global campaign, that's a jubilee campaign. Maria mentioned about that. That actually helped developing countries uh, under the highly indebted poor countries initiative and the multilateral debt initi uh, relief initiative. 
which actually write of most of Ghana's debt. Uh, by that time, Ghana owned close to $6.6 .6 billion, which was almost half in terms of the debt relief through the Ghibli uh, movement, and which brought uh, much of uh, economic relief to a lot of Ghanaians. There was much uh, investment in education, in the health sector, uh, in, in, in various social services, which had to allow the country to be uh, sustainable or to be on a sustainable path to development. Debt levels were very low. So the HIPIC initiative was very uh, beneficial to Ghanaians, to the poor, because particularly this initiative uh, required that the savings from the debt relief actually went to some particular uh, initiate, uh, social services initiative that benefited the poor. But by 2007, Ghana's economy looking brighter and looking promising for the future, uh, the World Bank and the IMF uh, and their foreign backers came in again and Ghana was advised to go to the euro bond market to borrow, which means that uh, Ghana is now borrowing at a commercial rate. Initially, Ghana used to borrow at the, with the World Bank and the IMF at a considerable rate, which is the concessionary rate. But this time, Ghana has to go to the private market to borrow at uh, the market rate, which was high. So Ghana had its first euro bond loan, about $700 million in 2007. By 2014, Ghana has racked up so much debt that it was becoming a problem. And Ghana needed to uh, uh, go to the market again for uh, more loans, but it did not qualify. But the IMF, particularly the, uh, the World Bank, had to come in 2014 to provide the financial guarantee for Ghana to be able to borrow about $400 million to keep the debt conveyor belt rolling, which meant that uh, Ghana just kept on piling debt. By 2016, most of the Ghana infrastructure also, particularly the power or energy sector, had problems. And here again, uh, very uh, expensive, uh, 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 yes, very expensive contract was entered into by local corrupt officials, which meant that it racked up Ghana's debt situation. And from 2016, it means that Ghana was actually wobbly in terms of the economic situation. So by coming into 2020, 2022, uh, the COVID-19 also came in because a, a country or an economy that rely on this narrow base of uh, raw materials for export as cocoa, and gold. Recently, Ghana also discovered oil, but that, that hasn't been so, uh, hasn't altered the situation that much because it is still a raw material that has to be exported before uh, revenues are used. So all that situation meant that Ghana was not able to sustain paying its debt. Uh, by December 2002, Ghana had defaulted because it cannot continue paying its debt again. Uh, so that uh, meant that Ghana has to go back to the IMF again, as uh, Marian said, about the 18th time, Ghana has to go back to the IMF to seek for loan to, you know, uh, support the economy whilst uh, uh, hoping that things will get better. But uh, it never got better. Uh, the IMF and the Ghanaian authorities agreed on a process, which meant that... Um, Ghana was to restructure or enter into a domestic debt restructuring uh, and also raise taxes to be able to sustain paying its loan that is going to get from the IMF. Actually, Ghana required about $3 billion or demand about $3 billion loan from the IMF. So many Ghanaians actually resisted uh, this hike in taxes uh, that brought a lot of people on the streets, uh, especially the labor unions. Uh, they resisted strongly against increases in taxes. They also resisted strongly against uh, using their pensions as collateral or for, you know, uh, 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 for the bailout. They required the government cut down the size of government. Uh, the government was uh, too expensive to run. If you look at the number of ministers and the corrupt practices, so they required the government has to fix uh, the government machinery itself before it seeks to uh, use their uh, low, uh, their uh, bonds and uh, 
yes, uh, or taxes to you know restructure the debt. But that re received heavy resistance from Ghanaians. But of course, the government had its way. Some local debt was structured, and that allowed the IMF to advance about a three billion dollars to Ghana. So Ghana was able to you know hook on the IMF um, um, loan. But which also meant that under the common framework, uh, 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 common framework uh, arrangement, which Ghana was to negotiate for debt relief, uh, eventually uh, Ghana was able to get uh, some uh, agreement with bilateral, which is government creditors, that they are ready to relieve Ghana some of it debt. But that is in principle. But because of the common framework, that has to be in sync with other creditors to Ghana or other uh, holders of Ghana's uh, debt, uh, particularly the private uh, uh, banks and big the, the hedge funds, they also held some of the loans. But uh, with negotiations, and just uh, about a month or two ago, uh, the private creditors refused to agree to the similar terms as the government creditors agreed to leave Ghana of its debt. So what it meant is that Ghana is not able to get debt relief. And the problem in the country now has brought untold hardship to a lot of people. Uh, price increases are almost uh, a daily situation. Poor prices are increasing electricity. Government attempted to increase VAT on electricity. That has also been resisted by labor unions. And uh, in terms of food prices have increased so much, sometimes over 100% increases in prices. And uh, the city currently is at a free fall. Uh, just for a few, within a few weeks, the city has fallen more than 10% uh, already against the dollar. So things are really very difficult for a lot of people. Whilst we are not seeing any way forward in terms of the government uh, uh, negotiations with uh, the private creditors, which are the big banks and the hedge funds, as well as while the government, uh, which is the state bilateral creditors, they have agreed in principle to relieve Ghana of its debt. But that also demands that the private creditors also give similar concession, but they have refused to do that. So currently, they are holding. Uh, the government of Ghana to ransom or the people of Ghana to ransom to get a debt relief. All this proves the fact that debt has become debt has become a major tool for which rich countries, big banks and private uh, institutions uh, or private businesses are holding developing countries like Ghana to ransom, of which we are often kept perpetually at that level. We are not able to get out of the trap and at a cycle that after every three or four years, we are always find out, we've always find ourselves in some of this crisis. And as Maria says, we are at our 18th level of IMF bailout, which is something that you would have expected that, I mean, uh, a solution would have been found. To. But of course, as a visual circle, it is the situation that we we'll find ourselves. Thank you very much for the opportunity to say some of these things. Uh, I hope that we'll have the opportunity to answer some of your questions if they do come. Thank you very much for the time. Over to uh, Wiz. Oh, Bernard, thank you so much. Um, I mean, thank you to both of, both you and Maria. What brilliant speakers. Um, I feel like I've learned so much in the last half an hour. Um, we've got some time for some questions now. And yeah, I'm sure there are going to be many. I know that some of you have been posting questions into the chat already. Um, but yeah, to make sure that we can put as many questions as possible to our two speakers, please um, please do post your questions in the chat box now. Um, like I said, we'll be sharing actions, uh, sorry, we'll be sharing links to the actions you can take by email after this call, um, and we'll also share them at the end of this call as well. So keep an eye out for those. Um, and just while people are, uh, uh, sharing their questions. Um, we did have one question in advance from uh, from Philip, who wasn't sadly able to join us this evening. Um, so the question from Philip is, colonialism um, has a damaging and lasting impact on our brothers and sisters around the world. We can't change the past, 
but we can take it into account when tackling just injustice and inequality. Expressing these views is often met with hostility by the powerful, labelled as woke or unpatriotic, and it can seem like gaslighting. Does this frustrate or inspire you? And how can we change the narrative to grow understanding of the issues, however uncomfortable some of them might be? Um, so I'm going to ask Maria if maybe you could kick us off with that one, um, as it's probably more kind of culturally appropriate to a UK context. Um, but then Bernard, if you yeah, if you want to say anything on that as well afterwards, that would be great. But we've also got plenty of questions coming through for you as well. So I'll just pass over to Maria to, to kick us off. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Swiss. Um, Great question. Um, I mean, the short answer is, yes, it can be frustrating. Um, from my perspective, I think, as an economist who's studied economic history, um, it needs to be to an extent about reclaiming the language of common sense. You know, it's often insinuated that these kind of historic narratives around colonialism and, you know, views that are considered woke are um, in some way anti-common sense. Um, I mean, I want nothing more than to have a common sense fact-driven discussion. Um, and I don't think I know what's more common sense than looking at history and what has and hasn't worked. Um, as I kind of said in my, in my speech, um, you know that we know what we know what adds up to economic development we know what kinds of policies produce development and we can see that um time and time again the conditions that are still being imposed on um countries taking loans are fundamentally anti development so i would say yeah let's it can be frustrating but let's just keep focusing on the facts and looking at history and seeing what has and hasn't worked looking at the fact that these debt cycles have just repeated and repeated and repeated and um you know if we want to see change if we want to see progress if we want to see reductions in poverty and suffering then we need to take a different approach um i, I think it's very difficult to look at what's happened over the past 50 60 70 years and and disagree with that um and just sharing this knowledge and making making it more accessible making discussions around economics and debt and finance more accessible because they're often shrouded in this language that is only accessible to to economists and policy wonks when really you know economics is everything um it d dictates our lives in many ways and yet so many people feel like they can't be a part of the discussion so really bringing people into those discussions and and having these difficult debates i think is really important i'd love to hear your views bernard yeah, thank you, Mariam. You have said it very well. Um, I live in Ghana. We have seen the structures. We've seen the colonial structures. We tend to think that maybe that's by accident, but uh, as things keep rolling out over the years, we see the evidence of it. For example, we see the structure, as I said, if you look at the fact that Ghana tried from the beginning after independence to, you know, get back, uh, diversify its economy and other things. But with influences from foreign governments, we lost uh, our democracy. We had about 18 coup d'etat, eight coup d'etat within a space of, uh, I mean, a few years, between 20 years, different governments. It means the country never was able to stand on its own, just always being influenced by foreign governments and foreign interests. And by the time things got so well, the IMF and the World Bank came in, uh, to support Ghana through the structural adjustment program. But today we see evidences of that in the fact that the liberalization has meant that any we have never been able to stand on our own, develop local industries, develop local economies. Anything that happened at a global level affects Ghana with the flip of a finger because uh, the economy is never on its so own. It's dependent on what uh, foreign in terms of businesses are doing most of the mining industry have been sold out to foreign uh, companies who are controlling. So when they take their money or their dollars out, then the city falls in the next moment. Now Ghana goes to the uh, uh, debt market to borrow. It borrow at a high rate when you compare to what rich countries borrow. You tell a country which is poor that ah uh, you cannot pay your debt. You are so poor you cannot pay, and yet your interest rates are so high. That you know, but if you look at like uh, debt justice, uh, 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 put out a research 
which meant that between 2010 and now, Ghana had paid close to $7 billion. A country that you say is that in terms of interest to loans, a country that you say that, well, it's a risky place to invest, so the interest rate has to be, has been able to pay close to $7 billion in, uh, in, the, in the decade. So what shows that continuously, in terms of debt, uh, the interest rate on debt for countries like Ghana is always often high to the point that it compounds the debt problem. So when you look at it, it looks like it has a kind of, it's a scheme that continuously puts, you know, Ghana at a place that you are never able to get out of it and be on your own to be able to develop out of, you know, uh, uh, on your own will, on your own uh, uh, resource and your own ability. You're always looking up to an outsider to decide which direction you have to go. So it really tells us that uh, right from the colonial era up to now, things hasn't gone any better. It has only changed from one, you know, one way to the other, but it is often the same way, keeping people under where they are perpetually being uh, uh, producing to serve the rest of the, the, the rich uh, businesses and governments around the world. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bernard. Um, the next question uh, was one from Crispian, which I think, I mean, you've kind of probably in part answered this already, but um, how much of the current debt now results from corrupt government in lower income countries? Um, and another question uh, for either of you, uh, the proposed, and this one's from the Garden Court Chambers webinar team, the proposed Debt Relief Act still leaves debt existing, although at a restructured level. What are the prospects of achieving cancellation of debt altogether for indented states? Um, so I don't know if Bernard, you might want to kick us off on that on that first question about how much of the current debt now results from corrupt government governments in lower income countries. Um, and then I'll leave it to either of you to, to tackle that second one. Thank you. That is a really brilliant question. Uh, yes, but uh, to say that it is really very difficult to see exactly how much of the debt uh, is due to corrupt uh, officials or governments in developing countries like Ghana. But definitely, most of the debt is also due to corrupt officials being in cahoot with their foreign uh, counterparts, businesses who have also an interest. In the sense that if you look at the current situation in Ghana, you had a finance minister that also has uh, its own uh, bank, we call it a data bank, that serves as an intermediary for most of the loans that Ghana uh, actually contracted over the period which means that they also benefited in terms of fees that they, they, they get paid when they uh, uh, mediate for loans that Ghana you know, actually got. So definitely corrupt officials played a role. And if you look at the fact that I talked about the fact that in terms of the uh, energy crisis and the energy infrastructure in Ghana in 2016 had massive problem. If you look at the kind of contracts that uh, government officials entered into, they were way too expensive if you compare to other countries. Uh, that was done definitely because of corrupt reasons. And all those things actually ended up making the debt situation worse. So often uh, it is the local officials, corrupt local officials, in cahoot with uh, the private uh, foreign backers or banks and hedge funds who have an interest and have something to gain together who caused this debt. But I will not be able to put an exact number on this, but in Ghana, it is very much aware that part of the debt crisis is also due to the, 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 the negligence or the uh, deliberate acts of corrupt officials. Thank you, and over. Yeah, um, that was put brilliantly, Bernard. Um, just, just to build on that, on the corruption question, because it is something that comes up a lot. Um, you know, corruption is, is, of course, a huge issue and another problem that requires resolution. Um, and if we want to see reduced corruption, then we need to see political and economic development. We need to see democracies develop. So I'd make two points on that. Firstly, for as long as democracies are being undermined by 
outside um, organizations and foreign countries, uh, essentially dictating the economic policies of countries, um, the, those nascent democracies are, are being kind of stifled, are being suffocated rather than enhanced. So it's not clear that um, that is a path to reduced corruption. Also, you know, these countries have been trapped in cycles of debt and bailout for more than half a century now. And these cycles of ba harsh bailout conditions um, and mounting debts are clearly, then they're, they're not producing political development or economic development. Um, they're suffocating it. So we're not moving any closer to, uh, to a situation where corruption can be resolved within the current global debt architecture. And meanwhile, you know, international asset managers and hedge funds are profiting from this crisis um, and plunging countries into yet more turmoil. Um, I tend to think that when countries remain trapped in, in crises of debt, poverty and climate disasters, leaders can often have increased opportunities for corruption and reduced oversight. So creating a transparent, sustainable, permanent, clear global debt resolution framework would create a more stable and prosperous environment within which corruption related issues could be tackled. Um, and then in terms of the prospect for global debt cancellation, I mean, it's happened before. I hope, I, I want to believe it can happen again. It is made much more difficult by this complex landscape of creditors with private creditors forming an increasingly significant proportion there, um, which is exactly why we need something like um, the UK debt justice law that that we're campaigning for. Um, but it's happened before. We'd love to think it can happen again. I think in the context of the climate crisis, it will be really interesting to see where these discussions go because there are um, increasingly ideas circulating around the ecological debt that advanced capitalist countries owe to low income countries as well. And whether um, we, well, uh, I'm sure many of us on this call would agree that that um, advanced countries owe climate vulnerable countries um, a debt because they have created the conditions which are now causing ecological crises in those countries. So that could create a more um, a more open environment for for discussing debt cancellation. Thanks so much, Maria. We've got a few more minutes for questions. I'm, I can only apologise that I think we're not going to get through all of them. Um, so we'll just try and get through a last couple before we before we wrap up. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Maria to maybe speak to a couple of questions. That are, well, one that's more specific to the UK context about is, is there any point in talking to MSPs? Um, and if you're able to loop this in as well, Maria, uh, if companies manage to find a way around the legislation passed in 2011 to force countries into debt. What can we do to prevent the same thing happening again? And that's from Rowan. Um, and Bernard, I was wondering if you might, there have been a couple of questions about, say, why why was it that Ghana was advised to borrow at market rates rather than concessionary, concessionary rates from the IMF? And what, yeah, why did it accept advice if loans at the, a, low, a lower rate were available? Um, so if you're if you're able to the two of you are able to um yeah maybe address those as the last questions before we wrap up that would be brilliant thanks so much uh, and maybe sure. let's so, with Maria if that's, that's all right yeah sure so I'll just quickly um respond to those um is it worth contacting MSPs I mean this um this legislation is. Uh, is relevant to English law. Um, so it does need to be passed by the UK Parliament. But really, we are at this kind of critical pivotal moment now where we're expecting a change of government um, in the next year. And there's really an opportunity to act and any pressure that can be put on um, Westminster political parties, uh, including from um, other com competitor parties, other political parties that are, that Labour will have to be competing with for votes in places like Scotland could be helpful. Um, so why not? The more noise around this once um, the next government is in office, the better. Um, the, the 2010 Act, um, someone was asking what we can do to make sure that 
companies don't get around this um, this legislation again. So it wasn't that, co that companies got around the legislation that was enacted in 2010. It was that the legislation from 2010 has effectively expired. So it only applied to a former global debt restructuring framework that is no longer in use globally. So it's not that companies were able to get around it, but that it expired and that we now need a new law to replace it that actually relates to the existing um, kind of current up to date global debt framework, which is the G20 common framework. Um, but you're right to point out that we're finding ourselves back in the same position. And that's why we are also arguing for a permanent, transparent, rules based, representative debt debt relief and restructuring mechanism within the UN because at the moment you have these um, ad hoc kind of frameworks popping up um, within groups that are um, that are dominated by creditor countries um, by the countries that are lending um, such as the G20 and and then after a period of time, then they're, they're no longer functional. And so legislative protections like this debt justice law, like the law that was passed in 2010, uh, are no longer effective. So we do need a permanent transparent mechanism for that. And hopefully that could go some way to helping um, alleviate corruption as well because of the transparency element um, and the clarity of that kind of centralized permanent process. Hello. Yeah. So thank you very much. Concerning uh, whether uh, why is Ghana boring at the uh, not boring at the concessionary rate, uh, but rather at a high, you know, but it's also because um, uh, Ghana was by two thousand and ten. Ghana was judged to be a middle income income country, uh, well, a lower middle income country, so did not qualify for much of the concessionary debt from the IMF and the World Bank. But it's also a system that IMF have tried to phase out since the uh, Jubilee Debt uh, Relief Initiative since the 2000s has tried to graduate certain countries like Ghana up from concessionary, uh, qualifying for concessionary loan and was forced to go to the, uh, the Eurobond market to borrow at uh, the commercial rate, which was quite high. Uh, that also meant that uh, Ghana needed to, you know, use those loans properly. Uh, what also what tells us is that Ghana didn't need that much. You have to develop at a pace that you can afford or can contain. But of course, it's the same pressure from the IMF and the World Bank looking at uh, growth and other things and forcing Ghana to go to the market to borrow at that rate. And the example is in 2014, when Ghana's debt was getting so high, Ghana didn't couldn't qualify for any, you know, of uh, wasn't getting a uh, loan from the market because of the uh, risk of debt default. But the World Bank has to come in uh, to guarantee for government at a very high rate, about 10%, 10.4%, 10 10 at a rate which is so exorbitant to allow the uh, IMF to guarantee uh, gov uh, the Ghana government loan, which will just mean that you are piling out debt for a country that you are saying that it is risky, it's not able to pay debt. But they know that in one day we are often going to you know, default. So the issue of uh, borrowing at the market rate compared to concessionary rate, most Ghanaians believe that we are not at a point that we should be borrowing so much from uh, the open market or the euro bond market and dropping our debt we should rather be looking if there are any concessionary uh, possibilities concessionary uh, uh, loans out there to borrow so that we develop at a pace that we'll be able to afford but not pushed into going to the uh, uh, for market uh, euro bond at the, at the market rate which is usually very exorbitant and very you know expensive if you compare to the rate at which the economy is developing compared to issues of corruption and other things. So we are forced by the whole the same global cabal of uh, financial uh, 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 system where they tend to, you know, at a very high interest rate, they tend to, each time Ghana goes out to the market, uh, the Ghanaian officials will come back, oh, Ghana's loan has been oversubscribed. Most of the banks, the hedge funds, they are so interested in Ghana's loan. But of course, 
at a very high interest rate, it looks very, you know, attractive for most. And that's what they boast about. But what it also means is that you are just tying a noose around your own neck, you know, but that's the situation. They are also encouraged by, you know, their foreign backers to go for those rates. And of course, uh, like I said earlier on, the local officials, whatever fees and all that, the kickbacks that they get from borrowing at this rate, is also out there and they, they tend to you know benefit from this. They don't look at the repercussions over a long period, whether they will be able to pay back their loan or not. They are just uh, within the cycle of the government. They don't mind what happens. Maybe by then they will be out of government. Another government is uh, is, is left to carry the, 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 the problem. And that is the kind of cycle that have been going through over the years. So of course, uh, the concessionary rate will be the best for a country like Ghana, uh, but uh, we don't have access to that that much. But we also mean that we should borrow uh, at a rate uh, that is affordable, but not at the rate that uh, we just go on for it just because that is what we are advised to do. Thank you. Over. Ben, th ben and Maria, thank you so, so much. Really sadly, that um, that does bring us to the end of our, our time. So I'd just like to, again, say a really big thank you to both of you um, for sharing your incredible knowledge and experience about this crisis and just for so brilliantly outlining what needs to be done to get debt cancelled for the 54 countries, 54 around the world that are in crisis right now. Thank you also to all of you for joining us on the call tonight. It's been really great to see so many of you here and I think just really shows the strength of feeling about this issue. So, yeah, I mean, I feel really confident that this election can be a big opportunity for us to get debt cancellation really under the nose of political leaders. So before you leave the call tonight, please do take a minute to click on the links that we're sharing in the chat box to the actions that you can take to make sure that in the run up to the election, politicians of all persuasions have debt cancellation on their agenda. We really need them to know that the UK can play a big role in ending this crisis. So please sign the petitions to party leaders and do let us know if you can join our stunt outside the Blackrock offices on the 4th of June in London. And like I said, we'll be emailing you those links um, after the event too, as well as the recording of tonight's event. So thanks so much again to all of you for joining and good night to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night.